Welcome, we have a visitor today by Sir John Odom. 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 <laughs> okay, <laughs> Odom. Yes. He's going to tell us more story about history and our church history. My grandfather was the first president and organized the South American Division of Seventh-day Adventists and was the first general vice president of the general conference and he traveled around the world during the 1930s and visited every church division and he, there are many stories from grandpa's trips too that I have recovered from the diaries but that was before my time. I was born in 1936 in Spain, my parents were missionaries to Spain, and when the fascists took over in the Civil War of 1936, uh, my family got left behind when Americans were evacuated. In Spain. And uh, I was born <coughs> in the municipal hospital, uh, 20 feet from a machine gun battery and under fire. and. My mother is a, or was a, a, an absolutely amazing woman. That says nothing about my abilities, but I think it says something about her. And we have been a missionary family ever since. I wanted to be a foreign missionary from the US, but my health, I've always had health problems of one kind and another. And my wife had health problems, so we were never able to pass physicals for foreign <laughs> service. But I taught in Adventist schools in Texas, California, Canada, and Illinois before I started working for myself. Uh, well, you teach us what, Sir John? Most, my degree is in chemistry, and mostly I've taught chemistry. On a few rare occasions, I have taught uh, biology, but I don't like to teach biology. I mean, DNA hadn't even been discovered when I took my degree, Whoa. so I'm not competent <laughs> in biology. And uh, I've taught physics quite a bit, and I've made my living as a physicist, and I feel competent in that area as well. How do you care? How do you came here in the Philippines? My parents How were called to the Philippines. We were in Panama. We were assigned to Panama in 1937. Oh. And my parents were called from the Pacific Press Publishing House in Canal Zone, Panama to <coughs> the new publishing house which was being built in Baisa, Calocan in 1941 but my daddy got sick we thought it was terrible that daddy got sick and he was not able to finish his work in Panama but and so my mother and brother and I were sent ahead to the US while daddy finished his work and we were all going to join up and go to the Philippines but the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor yeah. while mother and I were between Havana and Miami. And so we were delayed for the length of the war. We actually came to the Philippines in 1947. After the war. After the war. The war ended in 1945. The first missionaries to return to the Philippines after the war came on the, the uh, uh, SS Marine Links and we came on the second ship which, uh, which was available to civilians because the government was using all the ships 
to bring the people home and take refugees home. So we had to wait for a ship in San Francisco for a long time, several months. And we came on the General W.H. Gordon, which was operated by American President Lines only for one trip. Okay. All the rest of its time it was under government operation. But we got here on October 8, 1947 to Pier 7, Manila. We were met by the missionary families and the uh, Philippine Publishing House truck driver, Mariano Nabong. And he was the one who five years later took us back to Pier 7 to get a ship home. And uh, traveling on ocean liners of that time was unlike cruise ships of today. And we did not even travel usually on ocean liners. We traveled on what were called tramp steamers. They were freighters that went wherever there was freight to be had with no schedule. They would promise to get you where you were going sometime. But, uh, and we usually traveled on freighters. And the, the one trip from San Francisco to the Philippines on the General Gordon, that was a uh, originally an ocean liner, but it was used as a troop ship. So its accommodations were very primitive. The where were you where were you assigned up? To the Philippines? Yeah. My daddy became the editor in chief at Philippine Publishing House which was just being built in Baisa, Caloocan. And uh, the publishing house building is still there, and the three missionary houses are still there. Dr. Roy took me there to see them our first day in Manila. But there's nothing left of the college campus. What used to be my front lawn was rice paddies up to the front lawn. Now it's gravestones because it's the cemetery has taken over the whole campus, so. And when were you assigned? I was 11 years old yeah. at that time. I was, had just finished sixth grade in the United States. And because the American educational system required eight grades, I had to do two more grades here in the Philippines and they had a school for American kids on campus at PUC Baisa but I was the only student who was not third grade or below and the teacher would sometimes go all day without saying anything to me and in a few very short time I'd read all the textbooks, read all the stories, so what's there to do but sit there, twiddle my thumbs? So uh, my mother arranged with the union officers that when the division council was held in Manila, they alternated between Manila, Singapore, and Hong Kong when it was next held in Manila, that Elder Baldwin would be our house guest. And of course they were glad to have somebody take care of their visitor. And mother and I plotted ahead of time. And I, mother asked me while Elder Baldwin was sitting there eating dinner, she said, Johnny, tell Elder Baldwin about your school which is a very innocent question, but of course mother knew what it would lead to. And I told Elder Baldwin that my school was totally unacceptable, that I was the only student above third grade, that the teacher went for days on end without speaking to me, and I had read all the books and wasn't learning anything, I was wasting my time. And he said, well Johnny, what do you think I could do about that? And what he didn't know was that my mother and I had conspired 
and I had she had typed up a contract. And the contract was that when I have completed all my work for seventh and eighth grade, I filled in every blank in every workbook that I would request his office to send the official general conference exams and he would issue a transcript. And so when he said, what should I do about it? I went to mother's desk, got the typed contract, brought it to him, and I said, you could sign this. And he thought it was funny. And he signed right away, ha, 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 ha. And by the time he got back to Singapore by ship, yeah. I had already airmailed him a request for the exams, telling him that I was ready. And he sent mother a telegram saying, I can't do this, it's against policy. And mother sent him a rather tersely worded telegram, but it said, Dear Elder Baldwin, you would not want Johnny to believe that he could not trust the written promise of a minister of the gospel, would you? Signed Martha Odom. And we never got a reply from the second telegram, but we got a telephone call from the union office in Pasai. There's a big package here for Johnny. And it was the exams. I took the exams under supervision of one of the workers at the union office and I soon got my transcript and went and enrolled in ninth grade at PUC Baisa Academy. So what happened in 1947 after that? Well, as I say, in 1947 we got here on October 8, Daddy and I made a trip through Mountain Province in which we had many really wild adventures uh, during December of 1947. And uh, then in 1948, uh, I enrolled at PUC Baisa for, for, for freshman Freshman. High school, oh. which would be ninth grade in the U.S., but it was, it was high school here. It was uh, first year high school here, yeah. and uh, it was a very uh, the first year I had no problem. I had Josefina Pasqual, who taught me Philippine history. I had uh, Guillermo. Uh, Coresis, who taught woodworking. I had uh, Jose Parago, who taught agriculture. I took uh, uh, I don't remember. Oh, Justiniano Tawatao was my math teacher. Oh, you have a really and, good memory. Uh, <laughs> it was it was a, a very good. Uh, and that year, I also got a job as dishwasher in the college chemistry department, working for Professor Carl Jones. And Professor Jones's number one assistant was Welda Hamandre, and she managed the stock room. And I, my instructions from Professor Jones were, do whatever Welda asks you to do. So in effect, she was my boss. Even though Prof. Jones signed the time cards, yeah. Welda was my boss. And she taught me many things that students today are not taught about high quality laboratory work and laboratory technique. They're very sloppy today because they depend on their computers yeah. to correct their mistakes. and. Laboratory glassware is all now very highly 
controlled manufacturer so you don't have to test every piece. <laughs> but Welda taught me the hard way to do things, but the right way. And uh, she, was, she was a wonderful supervisor. So how many were you in students with uh, Doc Welda? Is that Doc Welda? Well, in, in my ninth grade classes, I think there were about 30 of us in the ninth grade. Oh, oh we had uh, Gloria Pangilinan, uh, uh, Rodi Eason, uh, Noblesa Pilar. Uh, these people all grew up to be very famous and well known in the Philippine Adventist yeah. circles. Noblesa is over 90 and still teaching voice in Miami. And she has more voice students than she can accommodate. I read a story about her 90th birthday. Somebody emailed that to me. And Did you still see her there in the US? She is still teaching, I last heard, about a few months ago when I began planning this trip. I learned that she was still teaching voice in Miami. So how about the mission trip in the Philippines when you were, as the years goes by? When we went to, to many, we went on many mission trips here in the Philippines to different, different places uh, in one, instance my mother was teaching health and home education classes she was an english teacher by education but the government had had a program that failed in trying to teach people basic hygiene yeah. babies were dying because of diarrhea and dehydration and that was because of lack of basic hygiene there was, the big problem was anus to mouth contamination because there was no toilet paper. The women were not as careful as they should be, as they needed to be to protect their babies. And then they would reach in and pull out their breast yeah. <laughs> with the same hand and they would feed the baby and the baby would get diarrhea and die. So mother started a program to teach basic hygiene, and the government's program had already failed. Which part of the Philippines is that? When we went in many different places. We went all up through the rice bowl of the Philippines in central Luzon, and also down through Bicol. Bicol. And then we went to Mindanao, and we actually went to Lake Lanao, and the Moro uprising, or whatever we want to call it, was just beginning then. But the Datus assured us that we were safe in their home. And they sat there with their machine guns across their lap, pointed at mother while she was teaching. And they said, we know that you are here to help our babies and not here for political reasons. That's why you're safe. And over and over again, we went to homes of known revolutionary leaders who would have been shot on sight by the constabulary, but they knew and heard what mother was doing yeah. and invited us to their home and assured us of their safety. In one case, I don't remember the name of the town, but we rode the, the Bicol Express, which was the steam railroad that ran to Legaspi from Manila. And it ran so slow that you could go up to the first class car, jump off, fill your canteen at the village pump, and jump on the back car and still make it. People spread their palai out to dry 
on mats between the rails. Yeah. And when they heard the train whistle blowing, they would pick it up and move aside while the train passed. Uh, and on this particular trip, we began seeing more and more constabulary people. Finally, we got to the point where there were tanks at the railroad crossing, a lot of soldiers, and then suddenly there were no soldiers. But there were many armed civilian men. And we were told to keep out of sight at the window of the train. And pretty soon we arrived at this town. I don't know the name of the town. It's really bugged me because I can't remember it. And we were met by a Filipino, our Filipino host, who was the local elder of the local church. And we went to his home. And we were, had just finished supper. It was Friday afternoon. It was Friday night. He had a U.S. Army Chaplain's Corps pump organ, similar to the one that Vita owned. Oh. And they asked Mother to play. Well, Mother sat down to play, and she had this piece that she had worked up for the pump organ, because you can't play just anything very well on a pump organ. It's a very limited instrument. Yeah. And she was playing the Holy City. And you know how it builds up to a climax. And Mother was pumping away at, at the organ. And he, and suddenly there was a very loud authoritative knock on the door. And our host jumped to the door and opened the door. And this man, who was rather tall for a Filipino, with a pearl-handled 45 stuck in his belt, MacArthur-style sunglasses on, two guys with grease guns behind him, opened the door and stepped inside and mother stopped pumping. And now whenever I hear that piece of music, I can hear it fading away. And he said, my name is Comandante, whatever it was, I have forgotten. And I am here to assure you that you will be safe in my village. My men are in control here. And they had a few pleasantries with our host. And he and his armed men left. And the next Sabbath and Sunday, mother taught her classes about how to care for babies. And her program was very successful. The original program that the government had used newly graduated nurses, gave them each team of two nurses, a Jeep, a generator, a 16 millimeter movie projector, a movie, and a screen. And they would go in the barrios and set up the movie projector and show the movie to the women. And there was no decrease in diarrhea. So the government pulled the plug on the program. And the union officers thought it was a good program, but they didn't know why it failed, so they asked Mother if she would, would help. Mother said, I don't know what to do, but I will go and teach the women. My mother, when she was young, had dark brown, almost black hair, but I never remember that. By the time I was born, yeah. she was gray, and very soon white. And in America, because of age discrimination, that's a problem. But in the Philippines, it's not. And wherever she went, she was referred to as the grandma. Yeah. And she taught her classes. The government found out that there were many fewer babies getting diarrhea where mother had been. 
So the health department came back and asked the women why. And they said, well, what the grandmother asked us to do is not hard. If it will help our babies, we will do it. So. <laughs> you always talk about your mom. You're always with her. What? You always talk about your mom. You're always with oh, her. Oh, she was absolutely an amazing, amazing woman. woman. She was an English teacher, proofreader, and editor by education and trade, but she could could do nearly anything. The book that was, the recipe book that was published by Philippine Publishing House, yes. which was called Tasty Tropical Treats, was my mother's. Now she never got credit for it. Her name does not appear on the book anywhere. I took the pictures yes. and sold the rights to the publishing house. They were the Monolisi children. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, but mother developed every dish in our kitchen on our back porch. She set up a window box with three stones and charcoal and a clay pot. And she cooked every recipe there outside of our okay. kitchen so okay. that she would know <laughs> the recipe. She would know how to make something authentic yeah. that people could actually use. Whereas, uh, and we ate mostly Filipino food in our house. The, uh, our house girls were first, her one was Trinidad. I don't remember her last name. The second girl was Esther Catalon and she cooked for us. I met Esther Catalon in at the general conference in uh, uh, Indianapolis in 1990. She was there and I went to a group of Filipino friends at, at okay. that. But she reminded me, she said, Johnny, I'm the one that cooked for you. <laughs> <laughs> and she was very good. So in the 1950s, what happened? Well, in November about late fall of 1951 Dr. Andrew Nelson and I had developed a relationship with him since 1949 when I was admitted to the college many of the administrators there were opposed to letting me simply because I was too young to let me enroll in college courses. But Dr. Nelson advocated for me. He was my mentor. Uh, we both were very interested in astronomy and he had purchased the materials for me to make a telescope for the college. And he introduced me to Dr. Cosmero del Rosario who was the first Filipino PhD physics graduate in the United States and he, Dr. Del Rosario was part of the uh, Oppenheimer team that put together the atomic bomb at Los Alamos and he then returned to the Philippines and was the director of the uh, Weather Bureau and the Weather Bureau was at, in the Marsman building in Port Area, Manila and it was very heavily guarded. Now, I could never have gotten in, except that Dr. Andrew Nelson knew uh, Dr. Del Rosario from other activities, and Dr. Nelson took me to Dr. Del Rosario and introduced me and asked Dr. Del Rosario to help me with my telescope because I was having some problems. And Dr. Del Rosario then became one of my mentors, and he opened the whole Philippine Weather Bureau instrument shops for my use and instructed the guards at the front door, whenever Johnny comes, let him in and call me immediately, even if I have a do not disturb sign out. I never, I had no idea what great 
privilege I was being given. And I'm sure that there were Filipino students as bright and deserving or more so than I. But because of my white face and, <laughs> and because I was Dr. Nelson's friend, I was you given privilege. wonderful privileges. And uh, uh, anyhow, uh, in then in the fall of 1951, Dr. Nelson asked me to come to his office and uh, he gave me books on surveying and asked me if I could do that kind of work. And I think I already told yeah. someone about how I ended up in Bukidnon surveying the new college property. So in Bukid what happened in Bukidnon? Oh, it was exciting. We had, uh, uh, I, with a group of fellows, surveyed the property. First was the old Crawford Ranch. That was relatively easy because there were established markers at the corners of that. There was a government surveyor there with me who took the official notes. I carried the instrument and made the measurements. And uh, those of us who were surveying during the day were expected to plow during the night because of the government requirements for homesteading and for getting this land grant. We had to have a certain number of hectares plowed and planted by a certain date. So we would, after supper, after working all day, you would be given an assignment for the night. And uh, I was very often assigned to drive the tractor to plow for half a night. And then you would sleep until morning and you both drive back in for breakfast and then... Is that in MVC or... What? Is, is that in M MVC that or... That is the, the, the land that became MVC. Oh. It was not... It was government land when we went there. They had not yet obtained the title to it. And so that's uh, how it started. Mrs. Malyati, of course, is well known for having negotiated obtaining the title to that land. But uh, uh, we surveyed it, and it was absolutely amazing. When I got there, they had already built a 24 foot square building of bamboo and kogon grass thatch. They had a, a shelter, which we called the maintenance shop, where they changed the oil and serviced the tractors. And on the other side of the building was a lean-to, which was the kitchen. And they served us only rice and mung beans. That was the only food that was provided. And Mr. Bartlett was what I call a, an evangelistic vegetarian. He believed that not only should his food be vegetarian, but everybody else as well. And we were provided with nothing but rice and mung beans which he said provided an adequate diet. And uh, I don't, I haven't checked the analysis, but <laughs> it was boring if adequate. <laughs> well, I did, I think I told you already about, about my hurting my leg, which was on the same road farther up into the woods <laughs> yeah. uh, where we, where the snake, Cobras happened. The cobras didn't like the woods. They preferred the cobra grass. They stayed out in the grass. But once you left the grasslands and went into the woods, there were no more, no more snakes. And uh, that was that was good. And uh, I went for many years with a left knee that hurt. But uh, I 
finally developed enough faith in the medical profession to get replacement knees. And it has been successful and, and good. But I had so many friends who got knee replacements back in the 70s and 80s and they were worse off after the surgery than they had been before. Statistically, I know there was an advantage, but when you know the people who got the bad scores and the statistics, that has more, <laughs> more emotional effect than the, than the actual numbers. The same thing is true with, with, with vaccinations. Somebody says, I know somebody who was vaccinated and died the next day. Well, you also know somebody who has died and didn't vaccinate the next uh, and uh, who died the next day after they didn't get a vaccination. So, you know, uh, emotional reaction. So I delayed getting my knees replaced until 2010. And this knee was painful for that whole time. Always reminded me of Mountain View. <laughs> so. so that's it. Do you have a book written about their, their history? or? No. There are many. I've written many of the stories. Many of them are on Facebook. I have given uh, a copy of my stories from my computer on a, a CD drive, a, a memory stick to Junior, and he will work on them. I would love to have a book published, but I am incapable of organizing a book. I only remember a story when something happens that reminds me of, oh yeah, that day, and then it comes back. I can't sit down at my computer and say, I'm going to write about stories in the Philippines because they don't come back unless something reminds me. Because we have so many, you have so many experiences and and my parents had wonderful experiences in Spain. I mean, the number of miracle people ask me all the time, John, why don't miracles happen today like they did in Bible times? My answer is that they still do. But, but we do not recognize them as miracles. For example, I have COPD. Excuse me. If I fly or if I uh, am above sea level or I have to exert myself very hard, I have to have supplemental oxygen. Medicare would not pay for supplemental oxygen. All they would do would be to provide an extra 20 feet of hose for the supplemental oxygen at my bedside. But I couldn't care for my wife if I couldn't leave the bed more than 20 feet. I couldn't walk uphill to my mailbox without portable oxygen. Yet, miracles happened, which got me the portable oxygen. One of my students found out Mr. Odom's having a hard time breathing. He put a GoFundMe on Facebook, and within 24 hours, they'd raised $8,000. They spent $3,000 to buy a portable oxygen unit for me. And we put aside the rest of the money for maintenance and repair and supplies and whatnot for the rest of my life. That should take care of me for the rest of my life. Then, five years later, the oxygen concentrator failed. I called up the manufacturer, told him what was wrong, gave him the serial number of the unit, 
And they said, oh, we're sorry. We no longer service that unit. It's more than five years old. So now I need oxygen. I have a unit which does not work. And that particular unit is no longer made. So the batteries that I have would not fit a new unit if I bought a new unit. I would still have to buy several thousand dollars worth of batteries. And I didn't know what to do. And then one of my former students called me up and said, Mr. Odom, I'm the truck driver for the Hamilton County Medical Society. They have just asked me to go clean out the office of a pulmonologist who has passed away. They want me to inventory all the equipment. I don't know anything about oxygen equipment. Can you come with me and help me inventory this equipment? Sure. So I went to help him inventory the oxygen equipment. I found there two portable oxygen concentrator. One was a late model, different brand than what I'm using, but one was an old model just like mine and several batteries. I thought, aha, my batteries will fit this unit. So I turned it on, nothing happened. Well, I'll take it home anyway. The other unit, turn it on, nothing happens. Take it home anyway. So I helped him make the inventory of all the stuff, fixed, took the, the two units home. And when I got home, I decided to take them apart, pull a battery out, and there's a plastic strip across the battery contacts. I pull the plastic strip off, plug the battery back in, it works. Amazing. So I look up the service manual on the internet to find out the service history of each unit, which is recorded in the computer deep down inside. So I look up service history, zero hours. I had a brand new unit which would have cost me $3,000 if I could buy it. But because they no longer service it, they no longer sell it, I couldn't have bought it if somebody had given me the $3,000. Plus one, which is in current manufacture. So I get $6,000 worth of auction equipment, which I need because I can't fly without it. And then I started seriously considering coming back to the Philippines, but it wasn't possible, you know, impossible. I don't speak the language anymore. Everything has changed. All of my friends and former teachers are dead. Yes, there are children and grandchildren of my former friends still living. But what do they care about Johnny that their grandpa knew, you know? But then Dawn reached out on Facebook. And then the next thing I knew, Dr. Roy Puin said, I'm going to the Philippines in February. You want to come along? I'll take care of you. And he made it possible. You're 72 here. years after I left, I was able to come back. And it's been just absolutely wonderful. I feel <laughs> I knew the Hamandre family. I knew Mrs. Magliotti. Vita was my classmate. And yet, when I stepped into this home, I felt like they were here. like throwback the yeah. times.
Manila was a terrible disappointment. Everything beautiful in Manila has been either destroyed or covered up. Manila was known before World War II as the Pearl of the Orient. When I arrived in 1947, all the bridges of the Pasig River were in the bottom of the river. The only crossings were U.S. Army Bailey bridges that had been put up by the Corps of Engineers after the Battle of Manila. Uh, the Luneta was a big, beautiful, broad, green expanse mm -hmm. in the center of the city from which one could look west and see the most beautiful sunsets in the world across Manila Bay. Wow. And it's all gone now. Yeah. The Luneta is nothing but a postage stamp between high-rise building Pier 7 Manila, which was noted in architectural magazines of its time as one of the most beautiful practical, useful buildings in the world been demolished because it stood in the way of big trucks on Pier 7, which is no longer used for passenger ships because there aren't any passenger ships. The ferries all run from a new terminal. The cruise ships all run from a different terminal. What was the passenger port of Manila in the 1930s when Manila was the pearl of the Orient, all container freight. <laughs> Manila is now the officially the world's most densely populated city, officially has the world's worst traffic. When I lived here, I could ride my bike from PUC Baisa to downtown Manila without any worry about traffic. But Other yeah. traffic were peddled bicycles, calesas. Now it's so crowded. And, and now it's so crowded with yeah. motorcycles and tricycles and so heavy trucks that I would be afraid to drive there, much less ride a bike there. So polluted. It's, the it's not I like was so fun. disappointed that my lawn at the house, at missionary house, at the publishing house, ended where the rice field began. And there was a catabao wall right there at the end of my lawn, and mm -hmm. I would mow right up to the to the catabao, and he would be there looking at me. And now right up to the property line, then it's gravestones because it's a cemetery. And <clears throat> it was it was terribly disappointing to see Manila. But when we went, Roy took me then to Artacho, and I had been to Artacho many times when I lived here, and a lot of Central Luzon in Pangasinan is still beautiful rice fields and banana and coconut. The houses no longer have Nipa thatch roof. They have blue galvanized steel roofs. But otherwise, it looked much the same. And I felt much better <laughs> seeing that a little bit of the Philippines still remained. I desperately wanted to go to Mountain View College on this trip, but because of Roy's business, and he was my host, uh, and he had to conduct business in Palawan, and that took a lot longer than we anticipated. We had to cut out Mountain View College. But Maybe next time. If there is a next time, if I wait 72 years, there will be no next time. But maybe <laughs> if God allows you to come back here again. <laughs> now, that I, now that I know I would be welcome in Iloilo, I might come back.
<laughs> I might come back. I can get an airplane ride direct all here. direct from the United States to Iloilo yeah. today. It used to be that the only choice was Manila, and I was afraid that I would not be able to get from the airport to wherever I was going in Manila. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, Roy knew exactly what to do and what to tell the taxi driver. He took me to the Manila, old Manila Sand, now Manila Me Medical Center, Adventist and, Medical Center, Manila. Yeah, and, in Pasai, and he took me across to the union offices. Uh, that has changed a great deal, but the missionary houses, some of them are still there. Mm -hmm. Some of them have been destroyed for the union office was built, and a, a new wall was built between the, the uh, Pasai English Church and the rest of the compound. Mm -hmm. And the wall has been changed from it was concrete blocks with broken glass and barbed wire on top, and now it is fabricated steel pickets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but what was the missionary family's badminton court beside Elder Lowen's house is now used for parking but the pavement is still there, and the paint, paint, painting of the stripes is still there. The White House there? The if you come in from the Union? From the, from the gate by the Union office, yes. immediately to the left, yes. behind the guardhouse, yes. there is a little patch of pavement, yeah. and that was the badminton court. Mm. And the house that was closest to that was occupied by the Union President, who was Elder Emmy Lowen when we first arrived. Now, presidents changed, and I don't remember the names of all of them. And then, if when you come into the gate by the uh, by the Union office, if you would turn right and go all the way to the back corner, that was Dr. Richley's house. And Dr. Richley had a full machine shop in his basement. And he repaired the elevator and all the machinery of the hospital personally with his own hands when there were people saying it could not be repaired. He knew how to do it, and he repaired that equipment. And when my daddy broke his back, we brought him from Talisai where he was swimming in Lake Taal and took a dive into shallow water and broke his back. We brought Daddy on a stretcher on a Jeep with the windshield laid down so there was room for the stretcher. I sat on the front fender of the Jeep. Mother sat beside Daddy in the back seat. We covered Daddy with a sheet which we held down with thumbtacks to keep the insects out because he was paralyzed. And the people of Talisai saw us carry Daddy out on a stretcher covered with a sheet. They thought he was dead. One year later, Daddy came back to preach the sermon he had not been able to preach. And when he came back and got up to preach in Talisai, the people were absolutely amazed because they said they had seen him resurrected because <laughs> they saw him carried out dead and done. here he is preaching. And the Aglipayan Catholic priest then came to the Adventist meeting where Daddy was preaching and started proclaiming that they had seen a miracle and started organizing a procession carrying a cross. And my daddy, after having experienced great persecution in Spain from the Catholic people, he 
changed his sermon topic immediately and started preaching about certain, the state of the dead and <laughs> the true resurrection and had a huge crowd gathered there before he was done preaching. And they asked him to go back and start over. And he went back to the beginning of his sermon and preached it all over again. And But when we took him to Manila, Dr. Heslani was there. Dr. Richley had gone to Baguio with his family for vacation. And when we came into the hospital, uh, the, Dr. Heslani asked for x-rays of daddy's back. And they did not have a radiologist read them. And Dr. Heslani was brand new. This was his first year in practice. He did not read the x-rays correctly. And he said, told daddy, you know, you'll be all right, just be careful a few days. And we were ready to take daddy home when Dr. Richley showed up. And he said, what's going on? I knew I needed to come back. What's going on? And the person at the desk said, they just brought in Elder Odom. He's hurt his back. And Dr. Richley said, let me see the x-rays. And Dr. Richley said, this is serious. Don't let him move. And so he said, Dr. Santos, and I don't know the, his first name, but he was a Dr. Santos who was a surgeon at the UP School of Medicine, had just returned from the US where he had taken a special course in back injury treatment. And he called Dr. Santos from UP and they came to uh, Manila San. And Dr. Santos looked at the x-rays and said they needed to put daddy into a cast immediately, a full body cast, and they needed to stretch him because his discs had been badly compressed. And so they put two screw eyes in the walls of the operating room. Dr. Richley went to his home and got two come-alongs, went to a harness shop, which was still there in uh, Pasai because they were still using horses to pull calesas, and he had the harness maker make a special harness to hold daddy's feet and another one to hold his head. And then they hooked, had daddy on the operating table, which was a U.S. Army surplus operating table. Everything was U.S. Army surplus then. <laughs> and they hooked daddy's feet to one come along, daddy's head to the other, and they started tightening until they lifted him off the operating table. Well, as soon as they lifted Daddy off the operating table, the operating table collapsed. And I was waiting outside in the hallway. Mother had gone to someone's house to sleep. But I was waiting in the hallway. And Dr. Richley poked his head out and said, John, I need help. And so while they put a cast on Daddy, Dr. Richley and I dragged the operating table out. He pulled a 12-inch adjustable crescent wrench out of his back pocket, and we took the elevating screw out of the operating table. This operating table had had the hand wheel bumped and that had slightly bent the screw. So every time the hand wheel was turned, the screw had been bent ever so slightly. And finally it decided to break. You know how you could break a paper clip or a hairpin by bending it over and over mm -hmm. again. Well, this broke. 
So we disassembled the operating table in the middle of the floor, just outside the operating room in Manila Sand, and took the screw and hand wheel over to Dr. Richley's machine shop in the basement. He welded the screw together, machined it back straight. We went back over to the hospital, assembled the operating table, and just as we got it back in and were starting to crank it back up, one of the assistants came out and said, Dr. Santos is ready to let him down now. And we rolled the operating table in under Daddy, rolled it up until the come-alongs went slack, and they disconnected them. And we, they then transferred him from the operating table to a gurney and took him to a room, and he stayed in the hospital for a couple of days, and then he went home with a full body cast. Okay. Sir John, we're so thankful that for the stories that you've been telling us. What? I, we're so thankful about the stories that you've been telling us about your experiences. Well, I'm, I'm glad to find somebody who appreciates them. <laughs> so. They're very precious memories for me. Yes, yes. I know. People today, particularly in the United States, have absolutely no concept of how blessed we are. Yeah. Of, and miracles. You know, my oxygen equipment, which is exactly the equipment that I needed to be able to fly to the Philippines, I got free is that reasonably possible according to the laws of physics? And yes. Is that likely to happen according to statistics? No. Is it a miracle? Yes. God started collecting that equipment in this doctor's office, new and unused equipment in his office long before I ever needed it. And yet, God sent my former student, who was a truck driver, to pick this equipment up. So you could get another cure. But it's a miracle. Yeah. No doubt about it, in my mind. There are many different kinds of miracles. There are miracles which are physically impossible like the, the going back of the shadow on the dial of Ahaz by 10 degrees. That is physically impossible. We have no idea how God managed to do that. God moves in mysterious ways. But God moves in mysterious ways. We have no idea how he could do that. But every day we experience miracles that we don't even recognize. We often say that we were lucky and there is no such thing as luck. It's miracle. The Bible says all, the King James Version says all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord. But my friend Jack Blanco who is, was the author, translator, preparer of the clear word says that a better translation would be God works all things together for the good of those who love him. God put that oxygen equipment brand new but obsolete in the office of that doctor and God knew that a truck driver would remember that his old teacher needed oxygen equipment. Nobody knew that. Yeah. Statistically, that's unlikely to ever happen. But it did. I've got miracles over and over again where God has 
intervene to save my life or prevent serious injury or in some other way benefit me. So guys, thank you for listening to Sir John for all the experiences and the trials and for all the God's plan for him and for the miracles that we have experienced and he has experienced for sharing uh, with us his story. Thank you for and see you again for another next time <laughs> when he <laughs> well